it's very difficult for people to imagine what it's like to have that experience very visual, very concrete um, and abstract at the same time of what numbers are. And so what I think is so wonderful about what Jerome has been able to do is to take um, words and adjectives and so on and put them into um, photographs that actually uh, resemble, I think, uh, very, very strongly, but also um, have an artistic element, which I wanted very much for them to have. Because for me, the numbers are not just uh, uh, imagery, um, but have a life to them. And I think that all good art is that which makes us think about life, about our own life, about life um, elsewhere. And the fact that, that, um, that I am able to, to ex uh, express how I, how I visualize numbers, and that I'm able now to work with an artist, a photographer, and to, 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 to realize this imagery and these images um, as art um, is very exciting, and we hope one day to exhibit um, these uh, pictures and paintings that I make and so on. Um, so first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about this condition, Savant Syndrome, because People think they know what savants are, and generally they don't know. And so there are many myths around what it is to, to have savant syndrome, to be a savant, that I wanted to address, and which I address in, in Embrace and Wise Guide. For example, the most famous example of savants that, that generally uh, people have heard of, have seen or know about, is Rain Man, the film Rain Man. I remember watching the film when it came out, I was nine at the time, and realizing that there was a connection between myself and the, this character, although we were very different. Um, but similarly, I realized that it was a caricature, and that it was only one representation, and a very limited one at that. He described visiting the savant twins, who he claimed were able to recite prime numbers up to 20 digits without any conscious uh, knowledge of how they did so, and also the ability to count instantly 111 falling matchsticks. Um, and when you look at these reports, you realize um, that there's very little to, to, to substantiate them. First of all, they were never made into a scientific report. Um, and uh, so there were studies that they are anecdotal, they are informal studies. But more uh, interestingly, um, there is just no um, record of any savant, myself or, or any other, high functioning or, or not, um, going on record and saying that we have such and such abilities. Um, I do have an ability to recognize certain prime numbers, to visualize prime numbers and so on, but certainly not anywhere near the region of, of 20 numbers, which is, which is truly fantastic. Oliver um, went into the room, there was a box of matchsticks by their bed, <coughs> Um, the matchsticks fell from the box onto the floor, and as they fell, the twins um, looked at looked at the, their visitor and said 111. So Oliver Sacks assumed, uh, with the knowledge 25 years ago of what savants are like, what autistic people are like, um, almost a kind of magical, supernatural way of looking at at the autistic mind, that they had somehow counted these matchsticks. A much more humane, realistic, scientific explanation is almost so simple as to be embarrassing to, to, to suggest, which is that having had the matchsticks beside them when he came to visit, that they had chosen how many to put into that box beside them. <laughs> when you think about it, 111, 111, it's a very matchstick-like number. So a computer like Deep Blue, for example, just a computer that beat Gary Kaspar, the world champion, in 1997, um, can calculate 200 million moves a second. In comparison, Gary Kasparov um, doesn't do anything like this. I mean, how does he calculate his, his chess? Well, he's not calculating at all. He's learned over many years how to think about chess in an intuitive way. He sees the board in a way that people who don't play chess or don't play chess to his level don't see it at all. In the same way that when I look at numbers, I see them in a very particular way that people who don't think about numbers in that way don't. And it's that which makes my abilities with numbers, arithmetic, calculating and so on different to other people's. It's not a case of raw processing speed. It's a case of seeing the numbers, and in the case of Kasparov seeing the chessboard, 
in a fundamentally different, much more intuitive, um, almost artistic way. A previous uh, chess champion in the 1920s called um, Capablanca, when somebody asked him how was it possible for him to play 30 players at the same time and beat them all, he said, well, I don't, uh, I only see one move ahead, he said, but it's always the correct one. We're shown the world as we grow up. People point to things, talk about things, um, but the words are just swimming all around us, the sounds. And who is to say what, what, what words should look like? Uh, and when you look at how many languages there are, and how many ways there are to say what each object is. You know, so in, for example, in English, a, a dog is a dog, and in French it's a chien, in German it's a hund, and so on. Um, these words on the surface look completely different. Um, so how is it we have the slightest idea of what we're talking about, literally? Um, linguists don't know. It's one of the fundamental problems of human cognition, of how the mind works. In Embracing the Wide Sky, I propose a solution, or a partial solution, to this problem. What I suggest is that everyone is born with fundamental intuitions for how numbers and language work. And these intuitions govern our thinking. And that these intuitions are um, universal, that they are found in the likes of Shakespeare and Hemingway, uh, in my mind, in your mind, in everyone's mind an African word, pambala. Does it describe a round, heavy person, or does it describe a, a thin person? And again, people who generally say that they're not very good at languages, don't speak other languages, most people who've done this test in my book say it's a round person, it's a heavy person. And they're correct, it is. And one of the most exciting findings of neuroscience is, of recent years, is what scientists call neuroplasticity. It's the idea that connections in the brain actually change uh, all throughout our lifetime, that it's never too late to learn, whether it's to, to write or to speak another language or to play an instrument. Um, and in the case of autistic people, high-functional autistic people such as myself, um, it's never too late to learn social skills that growing up we find very difficult When you start uh, your class, you quickly learn that it's not necessarily in your best interest to say that for you numbers are blue or shiny or shy or, <laughs> or left or right or centre. Um, you simply learn what the teacher is saying to you, numbers are meant to be like and words are meant to be like. And I think what is the, the, the most important characteristic for the savant mind, autistic or not, um, is that open-mindedness, that almost childlike quality to, of course, take in what teachers, what books, what education teaches us, but also to say, so I have a way of, of um, taking this information and making it meaningful for me according to my own unique experience of what it is to be human, to live in this world. Je vais essayer d'apprendre, je vais essayer, et c'est ça l'important, d'essayer, de tenter, d'oser. Souvent les gens disent, me disent, je ne comprends pas, je ne comprends rien. Les chiffres, les, les, les mathématiques, c'est l'horreur. Et je dis, d'accord, mais ça s'apprend. Ce n'est pas une question de, de génétique, je pense vraiment.